Welcome to Bedside Cardiac Ultrasound. My name's Matt Long. Let's begin. The learning objectives of this lecture are to interpret heart structures using ultrasound, cite the indications of bedside cardiac ultrasound, assess the ejection fraction and correlate to clinical condition, and assess the fluid status and correlate to clinical condition. Why would a clinician want to use ultrasound in their practice? Ultrasound can help you in many ways. It is very good at eliminating differential diagnoses by giving you specific answers to specific questions. It also can help you eliminate life-threatening diagnoses and treat them. It can help you guide resuscitation, knowing when to give IV fluid and when to give pressors. It can help you differentiate the shock state, and it can help you with goal-directed therapy. Also with ultrasound, we're able to estimate the cardiac function, primarily the ejection fraction and evidence of focal hypokinesis. This can be very useful in many situations. There are some differences between clinical ultrasound and a complete ultrasound exam done by a cardiologist. First, clinical ultrasound is, is performed by the treating physician, and as such, the physician must be aware of how to obtain the images, how to interpret the images, and then how to integrate them into clinical practice. Once this is mastered, though, this exam can be done at bedside, and it can be repeated as needed during therapy and help you treat the patient. It can also be used to guide therapy since it's repeatable. So once you integrate it into clinical practice, it can help you know when to give fluids and when to hold fluids. Clinical ultrasound is limited in scope, so you don't have to do the incomplete exam as a cardiologist would. So if you're just looking at the IVC to determine the fluid status, that is limited clinical ultrasound. If you need to do more, such as looking at the ejection fraction or evaluating for focal hypokinesis, that's also included. We're also not going to build this as a complete exam. We're going to build this as a limited exam. As such, we're not held to the same standards as in complete billings. There are times when you're going to need a cardiology performed echo. The cardiologist will give much more detailed information about the heart structure and function than you will probably want to do on your own. However, in the emergency management of patients, a limited bedside echo is invaluable and can help in many, many situations. Now, there are some disadvantages and pitfalls to using ultrasound at the bedside. There's often limited windows, so if you can't have a fluid interface for the ultrasound wave to transmit through, you may not get a picture. So ultrasound is limited by distance, bone, and air. When you're doing an echo, the most common uh, impedance for doing this will be bone and air. Now, you can position patients so that you can eliminate some of these uh, disadvantages or these impediments to using ultrasound. However, in some patients that are in the ICU or maybe very ill, you may not be able to position them correctly, so you may not even get a picture of the heart or you may get a, just a single view of the heart. So it is very limited in some patients. It's also operator dependent, meaning that the clinician is responsible for image acquisition, image interpretation, as well as clinical integration. Our clinical applications are assessment of patients with chest pain, shortness of breath, patients that are present after trauma and may have a thoracic injury, after or around cardiac arrest and to help with resuscitation, and in any patient with unexplained hypotension. Image acquisition begins with exposing the entire chest. Patients are generally supine, but the left lateral decubitus position with the arm raised above the head is ideal for most of the cardiac windows. This brings the heart closer to the chest wall and allows for much better imaging as we talked about before. Anytime you can get the lung out of the way, you will have much better imaging because air in the lungs is an impediment to the ultrasound beam. There are several probes you can use for the cardiac ultrasound. The sector probe, also known as a phased array probe or the cardiac probe, seen here at the top, is probably the most useful probe. It is meant to get between the ribs so that you're not imaging the ribs or having shadows and gives the most detailed images of the heart. The curvilinear abdominal probe that you see on the bottom is a three to five megahertz probe, so it's a similar frequency. However, it has a much larger face or footprint and so you will be seeing ribs and shadows on your image. If this is all you have then you may need to use this for your ultrasound exam of the heart however it is not ideal. Probes are oriented by convention. The convention for abdomen and cardiac are different. 
If you look on any probe, there will be a marker on the side of the probe as highlighted by the white arrows. These white arrows correspond to the white dot as you see in the picture on the right. In abdominal imaging, the pointer on the probe and the pointer on the screen always go towards the patient's head. If you have the pointer going towards the patient's head, then on the screen to the left is the patient's head and towards the right is the patient's feet. In abdominal imaging, the pointer goes towards the patient's right. And as we can see on the ultrasound, it is like CT orientation, with the left side of the screen being the right side of the patient and the right side of the screen being the left side of the patient. In cardiac imaging, the orientation is reversed. As you can see on the ultrasound exam on the right, the dot now is on the right side of the screen. Therefore, to do a cross-sectional image, our dot on the patient goes towards the patient's left. Now, it may be confusing why this is reversed between abdominal and cardiac imaging. One reason may be that it helps with orientation when you think about a chest x-ray. So if we look at this chest x-ray, the heart is on the screen left, okay? So we're looking from the back through the patient. When we superimpose the heart onto the chest x-ray, we can see that the left side of the heart is on the left side of the chest x-ray and the right side of the heart is on the right side of the chest x-ray. When we do an ultrasound with cardiac conventions, we see that screen left is the left side of the heart and screen right is the right side of the heart. Therefore, it's easier to remember left side from right side. If you used abdominal imaging, you would get the same image, but the chambers would be reversed. In this case, it's easy to see the left ventricle versus the right ventricle since the left ventricle is large. However, if it was an abnormal heart and the right ventricle was abnormally large, it may be difficult to tell the difference between right and left. Therefore, it's best to use cardiac protocols so that it is easy to determine left from right, even if another person is looking at your images. Now, you can write this down to which way you point your probe and how you orient it. But it's easier to remember that you're going to be having the probe towards the patient's head if you're doing long views of the heart, or you're going to have it towards the patient's left. As we go through each window, I will point out which way the probe is oriented and it will become clearer. There are several windows. The ones that we generally use are the subcostal or subxiphoid window, the parasternal, and the apical window. Why do we use three cardiac windows? As I mentioned before, in most patients, you cannot get all three windows, so having a general knowledge of all windows will help you in obtaining a view in most patients. Some patients may only have one view. In the subcostal window, we place our probe underneath the xiphoid with the dot oriented towards the patient's left. When we do this, we are imaging through the liver, so we see the liver at the top part of the ultrasound beam. The first chamber that is encountered would be the right side of the heart, would be the right ventricle and the right atrium. You can tell the right atrium from the right ventricle as you can see that the IVC courses through the liver into the right atrium. The left ventricle is further down on the screen or further up into the chest and the left atrium is across from the right atrium. In this example we can see using a cardiac probe we have the dot oriented towards the patient's left. As such we can see the liver at the top part of the screen we have the right ventricle against the liver and the right atrium just to the screen right. Deep to that we see the left ventricle. Notice that we have to image through the liver so we have a great distance to go through before we image the heart. The greater the distance, the less the resolution. Here's one that's imaging a little bit better as we have a smaller amount of liver. Therefore, the detail is better. In the proximal portion of the ultrasound, you see the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, and then right atrium. Deeper still, you see the left ventricle, the mitral valve, and the left atrium. In the center of the ultrasound image is the aortic valve. The inferior vena cava is easy to image after you've done a subcostal image of the heart. Typically, you stand the probe straight up and turn the pointer towards the head as we want a long axis view. Here's an example of doing this. We are subcostal looking through the liver at the heart. We stand our probe straight up, pointing towards the spine, slide over generally towards the right, and we see the liver, and posterior to the liver, we see the IVC coursing. One more time. Stand our probe straight up, 
slide to the right. When we do that, we see the IVC posterior to the liver coursing into the right atrium. The dark circle above the IVC is the hepatic vein. Why do we care about the IVC? Well, the IVC gives us an idea of fluid status. The subcostal IVC will vary in size based on respiration and the central venous pressure. We'll talk more about this in a little bit. The parasternal long view is a very useful view. This view gives you a very detailed image of the left ventricle and the left atrium and the mitral valve. To do this view, we point the dot towards the head because this is a long axis view. However, since the heart is angled in the chest, we turn the probe so that it is pointing from the right shoulder of the patient towards the PMI. When we do this, we get a long axis view of the heart. You can see the left ventricle very well, the endocardial border, the posterior wall. You can also see the left atrium and the mitral valve. And you can see the ascending aorta, the aortic valve. And if you look at the bottom of the image, you will see a dark circle, and this is the descending aorta. Here we are, we have our pointer oriented towards the patient's right shoulder. It's generally towards the head, but because the heart is at an angle, we have our probe angled also. We see the left ventricle is the main part of the image. We can see the left atrium, the mitral valve, the valve apparatus or structures, the chordae tendon A going into the ventricle. We see the aortic valve in the center of the screen, the ascending aorta, and if you look posterior, you can see a black circle, which is the descending aorta. If we turn our probe 90 degrees, we get a parasternal short view of the heart, which is really a CT scan view of the heart. So we start parasternal long, pointing towards the right shoulder, and we switch to the other shoulder. So 90 degrees, when we do that, we see this cross-sectional view. Now, as we pan our probe up and down, we have different views of the heart. So if we pan towards the apex, we start seeing down into the ventricle. As we come neutral, we start seeing the mitral valve. As we start panning towards the other shoulder, the right shoulder, we start seeing the aortic valve. So you have to pan your probe to start getting different views of the heart. The aortic valve is seen as a tricuspid valve. It looks like a Mercedes Benz sign. The mitral valve looks like a fish mouth opening and closing. And the ventricle is generally a circular structure. You can see the papillary muscles. You can also see the cross section of the right ventricle. Here's an example of the ventricle and we're panning up through the mitral valve. Mitral valve looks like a fish mouth and then up into the tricuspid aortic valve. This is the aortic valve. We're staying on it. You can see that there are three leaflets. The black structures around the aortic valve are all parts of the heart. You can see different valves. Up at the top right corner, you can see the pulmonic valve, and then the, you can see the atria down below. When looking into the ventricle, you can determine the names of each of the walls. The easiest way is to start out looking at the left and the right ventricle themselves. You know that the septum is in between this, so it's easy to identify the septum. Then you can go around the ventricle like a clock from anterior to lateral to inferior and back to septum. As you pan up and down the ventricle, you will have different portions of the ventricle. So up near the base is called the basal segment. Middle of the ventricle is the mid segment and down towards the apex is the apical segment. You can match up the segments to the coronary arteries also, as you can see above. Here we are in peristernal short. We see the septum very well. And again, going around the clock, you have anterior, anterior lateral, inferior lateral, inferior, and then back to septum. You can see the papillary muscles very well in this view. That also helps you know that you're looking at the inferior wall. The apical view is the last view. For this view, we point our probe to the patient's left and we slide the probe all the way till we hit the patient's PMI. When we do this, we get an end-on view of the heart. The left ventricle should be where the PMI is, so if we are placing our probe directly on the PMI, we will get a long axis view of the left ventricle through the mitral valve to the left atrium. 
If we orient our probe correctly and we're using cardiac imaging, we will have the left ventricle being on screen left or the right side here and the right ventricle being on screen right. Here we are, we have our pointer on the PMI, we have the patient in the left lateral decubitus position which brings the heart close to the chest wall, makes it easier to image. The dot is going towards the bed or towards the patient's left. We see the left ventricle on the screen right. The right ventricle is to the left. Notice that the left ventricle apex is not directly at the tip of the image. This is because we're not directly over the PMI. To get the image directly end on, you would slide the probe towards the patient's left, and that will bring the image into correct view. By rotating the probe, we'll go from a four-chamber view to a two-chamber view, and then to a three-chamber view. The two-chamber view will only have the left ventricle and the left atrium. The three-chamber view will have the aortic outflow tract and the aortic valve along with the left ventricle and atria. The five-chamber view can be obtained by rotating the probe in the opposite direction. In this view, we'll have the four chambers that we were talking about before, but we'll also add the aortic valve. This is called the five-chamber view. So let's go over some cases. 46-year-old man, two hours post-surgery in the ICU. He's been intubated, he's on mechanical ventilation, and he becomes hypotensive. He has an extensive medical history with multiple comorbidities. And during the evaluation, he develops cardiac arrest. The initial rhythm is PEA. How can bedside ultrasound help you on resuscitation? Well, why do you want to use ultrasound and cardiac arrest? Well, the accuracy of pulse check is very limited. So it's very difficult to tell if a patient has a pulse by using your fingers. It's fairly unreliable, in fact. Not giving CPR when needed was found to happen in 14% of the patients, and giving CPR when not needed in 36% of the patients. Further, new guidelines recommend limited interruptions of CPR. By using ultrasound, we do not stop CPR to see if the heart is beating. You can see the heart beating even during chest compressions. If you have a difficult time, chest compressions can be stopped for a second to see if the heart is moving and then resumed. See this example, this is a subcostal view of the heart. We see the liver at the top of the screen, the right ventricle, and then the left ventricle. It's difficult to know if this patient has a pulse with this amount of cardiac activity, but it's easy to tell that the heart is moving. In this example, we can see that there's cardiac activity. This is a subcostal view. The right ventricle is at the top of the screen. The left ventricle is deep on the screen. We can see that the left ventricle is squeezing. Therefore, the patient probably has some type of pulse, some type of blood pressure. You begin therapy and you ultrasound again in a few minutes. And what do we see? We see the left ventricle is worse. Therefore, whatever therapy we did is not working and we should move on to new therapy. After a while, we start to see clots in the IVC. This so is the IVC coming into the right atrium and you can see these hyperechoic structures flowing in and out with respirations. There's no cardiac motion. Leads represent clots or thrombus, and this patient is unlikely to survive their cardiac arrest. Ultrasound is highly useful in differentiating the cause of arrest. This is why we would like to use it in all of our patients that are about to arrest or have arrest. In PEA, we intensify our search for reversible causes because we know that patients with PEA or some type of cardiac activity on ultrasound have a chance of survival. In this study, we see that the patients that survived had some type of cardiac activity, either PEA or ventricular fibrillation. Those that had no cardiac activity did not survive. This is not an absolute, even though these studies show 100% death with no cardiac activity. Though 100% of the patients died in the group that did not have cardiac activity, these studies may not be measuring the same patient population that you may be working with. So you may not want to end your resuscitative efforts until you have completed your ACLS protocol. So pulseless electrical activity is best defined by ultrasound. You rapidly identify easily reversible or readily reversible causes, such as hypovolemia, tension pneumothorax, acute MI, acute massive pulmonary embolism, and pericardial effusion and tamponade. So for hypovolemia, the central venous pressure is a great marker of how much fluid is in the tank, so to speak. It's a measure of the thoracic vena cava, 
is a good approximation of the right atrial pressure, and we use this to differentiate shock states. The ultrasound marker of central venous pressure is IVC variation with respiration. As the thoracic pump works, as you expand your chest wall, you pull air into your lungs, but you also pull blood out of the IVC, so the IVC will collapse during inspiration. Consequently, the IVC dilates during exhalation. The maximum diameter and variation vary according to the IVC pressure. This is generally a linear relationship varying between 5 and 15 millimeters of mercury and the IVC diameter between 5 and 20 millimeters. However, as the IVC approaches its maximum, increasing amounts of pressure do not increase the IVC diameter further and there is a plateau. On the other end of the spectrum, when the IVC is completely empty or the central venous pressure is very low, the IVC diameter is very small and may look slit-like or completely collapsed. There's two methods of quantifying IVC variation as regard to central venous pressure. The first one is the gestalt or estimated percentage and this is a qualitative measure. You can also develop a collapsibility index or a quantitative measure. We'll cover both of these. So, you have a small diameter IVC, less than one and a half centimeters, and it's completely collapsed. You know that the right atrial pressure is very low. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a dilated IVC with dilated hepatic veins. As you breathe, there's no change in the diameter. You know at this point that the right atrial pressure is very high. It's unclear how high it is, but we know it's greater than 20. In the middle, we have a normal IVC to a dilated IVC that is collapsing. If it's collapsing more than 50%, we know that we're on the lower end of the central venous pressure. If it's collapsing about 50%, we're in the middle, about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. And if it's dilated but only collapsing a little bit, then we know we're on the high end of our central venous pressure, 15 to 20. This can be a little bit challenging to remember, so it's better to think of the IVC first. So you look at the IVC, it's small, it's very slit-like, it's hard to identify, since it's slit-like, it is completely collapsed. We know our central venous pressure is very low, 0 to 4. If you look at the IVC and it's very dilated, it's easily found, and it's not collapsing with respiration, we know that our central venous pressure is very high, greater than 20. And everything else is in the middle of the bell-shaped curve. So if it's small to normal size and it's completely collapsing, we have a low central venous pressure. As the amount of collapse decreases, then we know we're in the normal range of central venous pressure. If we see the IVC and it's collapsing, but it's collapsing just a very little bit, we know we're at a high central venous pressure. Let's see some examples. So here we have the IVC. It's just posterior to the liver. It's running to the right atrium. We can see the IVC and it's collapsing. And as it collapses, the walls are touching. This means that the central venous pressure is low. Here, we're using abdominal imaging or abdominal orientation. We see the IVC posterior to the liver. We see the IVC. When it's collapsing, it's collapsing about 50%. The walls are not touching. So we know that we have a normal central venous pressure. Again, abdominal imaging here. We see the IVC. It's quite large. However, when the patient breathes, it is collapsing. But that collapse is a very small percentage. Therefore, we know this is an elevated central venous pressure. And here we have a very large IVC. The hepatic vein itself is very dilated. And as the patient breathes, there is no collapse of the IVC. In this case, we know that the central venous pressure is very high. We can use M mode and measure the maximum and the minimum size of the IVC. In this case, a maximum size of the IVC is 1.35 centimeters and the small size is 7.4 millimeters. If we take the maximum, subtract the minimum, and divide by the maximum, we get a percentage. In this case, it's 45 percent. In reality, knowing the exact percent of collapse is not that useful. Knowing an estimate of the right atrial pressure or the central venous pressure is very useful. Therefore, I do not generally calculate a number for the IVC. Let's go back to our case. We had a patient in PEA. Our differential PEA is hypovolemia, tension pneumothorax, acute MI, acute PE, 
pericardial effusion and tamponade. So here we are. We have our IVC. We're looking at the heart. You can see that they have a pulse now. We look at the IVC. What does it look like? Well, it's dilated. The hepatic vein is dilated. And as they breathe, the IVC is changing very little. Therefore, we know that the central venous pressure is high. Do we see anything else that's abnormal in this ultrasound image? If you look at the right atrium, there is a small hypochoic area between the diaphragm and the right atrium. This may be something of interest. Let's take another view. As we turn to our subcostal view, we see the liver at the top of the screen and we can see the heart. And we can see there's a hypochoic structure around the heart. What is this hypochoic structure? This is a pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion is accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac. Since the pericardium is relatively fixed in volume, any increase in pericardial fluid volume decreases venous return to the right atrium, decreasing cardiac output. This can lead to pericardial tamponade. However, this size of the pericardial effusion can be deceiving. Big does not always mean bad. For example, an emergency or pericardial tamponade. Small does not always mean insignificant though. So how do you know the difference between a small, significant effusion or a large, not significant effusion. In a textbook, you'll read that pericardial tamponade is defined by right atrial or right ventricular collapse during diastole. This can be challenging, though, to detect using ultrasound. Here in this example, we have the RV collapse marked out with an arrow. In this case, this is tamponade. This is right ventricular collapse during diastole. That would mean that there is a lot of pressure around the heart not allowing for diastolic filling of the heart. It is difficult to tell diastole, however, and so without this marker showing you right ventricular collapse during diastole, you would be hard pressed to say if this is tamponade. Here's another example. This one's much easier. You can see that the right ventricle is completely collapsed during all of the cardiac cycle. As such, you know that this is tamponade. You can see the IVC is also dilated and not collapsing. In this example, this is a hemopericardium. Is this tamponade? Very difficult to tell. The right ventricle is collapsed, but it appears to be filling somewhat. This patient was hypotensive and this was a pericardial tamponade. In this example, we see a large pericardial effusion and we can see the heart swinging in the pericardial sac. Is this pericardial tamponade? Difficult to tell because it's difficult to determine the right ventricle, the right atrium, and whether it's collapsing during diastole. Since it's difficult to tell right atrial, right ventricular diastolic collapse, a better method would be to look at the IVC. As clinicians, we know that a patient who has hypotension, tachycardia, and an elevated central pressure with a pericardial effusion more than likely has tamponade. And this is what the sensitivity and specificity shows us. If we look at right atrial right ventricular diastolic collapse, the sensitivity is fairly low. Because tamponade is a spectrum, you may have hypotension prior to having complete collapse of those two chambers. However, as the pressure in the pericardial sac increases, central venous return will decrease. That's the definition of pericardial tamponade. And the IVC will dilate. Therefore, the sensitivity of IVC being dilated and not collapsing during respirations with a pericardial effusion, the sensitivity is very high, 97%. So as clinicians, we should be using the IVC to determine if tamponade physiology is present or not. So if we look at our patient, we have a pericardial effusion. Is the right ventricle collapsing during diastole? Is the right atrial collapsing during diastole? It's hard to tell. However, we know that the patient has just arrested, is hypotensive, has a pericardial effusion. So let's look at the IVC. In this case, we can see the IVC is dilated. It's not collapsing. Therefore, this is cardiac tamponade. Another case, a 50-year-old male presents with lupus and AIDS. He had sudden onset of shortness of breath. His vital signs show that he is hypotensive and tachycardiac. This is the definition of shock. 
So how can ultrasound help us in the resuscitation of this patient with shock? Well, ultrasound is very good at differentiating unexplained hypotension and shock. It can help you identify severe hypovolemia, cardiac tamponade, septic shock, global cardiac dysfunction, and massive pulmonary embolism. So these are the questions I ask whenever I'm using ultrasound for a patient that's hypotensive. Is there a pericardial effusion? I look for tamponade. Is the heart hyperkinetic? I look to see if the heart is empty or if the heart is overloaded with volume. How well filled is the heart? Assess the IVC, its size, and its collapsibility. Is the heart hypokinetic? If it is, how bad is this hypokinesis? Which ventricle is involved? Is there evidence of ischemia? When I cannot find any cardiac indicators for the hypotension or shock, I begin looking in the thorax and abdomen for other reasons the patient may be experiencing the hypotension. This leads us to a discussion of cardiac function. Estimation of the ventricular function can be done with bedside echo. It does take some experience, but is not that difficult. There are two ways of estimating ventricular function, a qualitative measurement and a quantitative measurement. The qualitative measurement does not sound as precise as the quantitative measurement. However, qualitative measurements are most appropriate for bedside clinicians using ultrasound. It's the simplest method, giving you a range of cardiac function and not a specific number. However, clinicians will be integrating the entire exam into their differential diagnosis and their treatment plan. As such, knowing whether the cardiac function is good, bad, high, low, is just as good as knowing that the EF is 45% or 40%. By using the qualitative measurement, we do this by visualizing the endocardial border between diastole and systole. Greater than a 50% change is normal. Less than a 50% change is diminished. So let's look into some examples. This is a peristernal long view of the heart. We see the left ventricle in the middle of the screen. We visualize the endocardial border. We look at the black space or hypoechoic space. This is the chamber filled with blood. We look during systole and diastole and we estimate how much of the black space is disappearing. In this case, it's more than 50%. So this is a normal EF. This is the same view, peristernal long axis. We see the left ventricle in the center of the screen, look at the endocardial borders, and estimate how much of the black space is disappearing. In this case, we know that it's a depressed EF, so this is a low ejection fraction. So, instead of using numbers like greater than 55%, 45 to 55%, let's use descriptive terms. Hyperdynamic, normal, mild hypokinesis, moderate, or severe. Let's look at this example. In the center of the screen, it's very difficult to see, but this is a heart that is beating fairly rapidly. This is a peristernal short. You can see that there is a black space in the center of the screen. This is the left ventricle, and you can see that the black is completely disappearing. This is a hyperdynamic heart. This is a near 100% ejection fraction. This is called the kissing papillary muscle sign because the ejection fraction is so high that the papillary muscles are touching each other. This is a sign of significant hypovolemia. Here's our peristernal long again and the heart we looked at before just to get an idea of a normal ejection fraction. And this example here, this is an apical four chamber view. We see the left ventricle. We look at the endocardial border. We can see that it is squeezing. It doesn't look quite as good as the last video. Less than 50% of the blood is being ejected from the left ventricle. So this is a depressed EF. However, it is very slight. It can be confused with being normal. In this case, this is a mildly depressed EF. This one's more obvious. This is an apical two-chamber view. We can see that very little of the black space is disappearing. This would be a severely depressed EF. In this view, this is a peristernal short. We can see that the black space is not disappearing. Therefore, this is also a depressed EF. Now, it can be a little challenging. We look at this example, we look at the black space, and a large portion of the black space is disappearing. So we would say that the EF was normal, maybe even elevated. 
But remember, you are only looking at two walls in this image. You're looking at the septal wall and you're looking at the lateral wall. Therefore, if those two walls are abnormal or compensating for other abnormalities in the rest of the ventricle, then you may not get a clear picture of the EF or an erroneous picture of the EF. So here are the walls just illustrated. We can see in peristernal long axis, we see the anterior septal and the inferior lateral wall. We've already discussed in short axis the walls as we're going around a clock. And then in apical, you can see the walls by rotating your probe. So you go from an anterior lateral and inferior septal to an anterior inferior and anterior septal inferior lateral. We also have to talk about different types of wall motion. Normal wall motion is all of the endocardial border coming in towards the center. A hypokinetic segment still maintains the movement in towards the center, however it is much less than would be expected or compared to the surrounding endocardium. An akinetic segment is a thin segment that does not move at all. And a dyskinetic segment is a thin segment that moves opposite of cardiac contractility. Therefore, as the heart is squeezing in towards the center, the dyskinetic segment moves out and away. So let's go back to our example. We're in an apical four-chamber view, so we're looking at the anterior lateral wall and the inferior septal wall. We can see that the apical portion of the inferior septal wall is not moving as well as the anterior lateral wall. This is a hypokinetic segment. If you look at the anterior lateral wall, you can see that it is contracting more than would be expecting. So it is actually increasing the ejection fraction by compensating for the wall motion abnormality of the septum. In this case, the EF is normal, but that is because of this compensation. In this example, we have another apical four chamber, so we're looking at the septal and anterior lateral wall. We can see that the septum is not thickening. This is in a hypokinetic segment. The apical portion of the anterior lateral wall is also contracting very well. If you looked in the entire ventricle, this is a hypokinetic ventricle. This is a mild to moderately depressed EF. Peristernal short axis we talked about before, identify the septum. When you identify the septum, then you can go around the clock, and we have anterior, lateral, inferior, and back the septum. So in this example, we can see the septum. We don't see the anterior wall very well due to artifact, but this is a global hypokinesis. None of the walls are moving in well, but the septum is completely akinetic. The qualitative measurement can be useful. It helps confirm your diagnosis of hypokinesis or depressed ejection fraction, and it can give you a number for recording into your chart. In reality, your global assessment will be much more accurate as there are many pitfalls to the quantitative measurement. I'm going to teach you two methods of, of calculating the EF. Each has its advantages and each has its disadvantages. The first one is the LV dimensional method. This uses a peristernal long axis image of the heart. Using M mode, the line is placed through the ventricle at the tips of the mitral valve. The line of the M mode should be perpendicular to the long axis of the heart. When we do this, we get a view that shows us the walls of the ventricle as they collapse during systole and diastole. Each machine will have a different calculation package. In this case, this is a sonocyte. And as we do this, we mark the septal wall. We mark the uh, chamber size during diastole and systole, and we mark the posterior wall. When we do this, we get an ejection fraction that is calculated. The advantage is that this method is very easy and quick to learn and perform. The disadvantage is that it provides information only about two walls the septal and the posterior wall. So a wall motion abnormality that involves these two walls or involves the other two walls 
may lead to an overestimation or underestimation of the EF as all walls are not visualized. It's also difficult to obtain the true axis of the heart in some patients and put the M mode line directly perpendicular to the long axis of the heart. If this is not done correctly, you can get an overestimation of the EF. The other method is the 2D method of Simpson. In this method, we use an apical two-chamber and an apical four-chamber view of the heart. In both cases, you trace the ventricular cavity, including the papillary muscles in both diastole and systole. So, you image the heart in four chambers, and you make a cine loop, and you scroll between systole and diastole. When you do this, you use the software package to trace out the ventricular cavity in systole and diastole in four chambers, and rotate 90 degrees and do it in two chambers, and you will have an average that will, of the EF using all four walls. The advantage of this view is that it's much more accurate than the LV dimensional method as you're using all four walls to calculate the EF. It's the most widely used method because of this. However, it is more time consuming and more difficult to do. Also, the probe must be at the apex to give a true view of the left ventricle. If it's off axis, you will underestimate the EF. Also, parts of the ventricle can be difficult to visualize using the apical view, particularly in patients which cannot move or roll to the left lateral decubitus position. So this method of calculating the EF may not be possible in critically ill patients. Chamber size is also an important portion of the bedside cardiac exam. It may not be intuitive as to which chamber is the largest in the heart. However, since the left ventricle does the pumping of the blood through the heart, it has the highest pressure and is the largest chamber. The left atrium is the next highest pressure to, in order to fill the left ventricle. Therefore, it is the next biggest chamber. The right ventricle is actually the smallest chamber in the heart as it is the lowest pressure chamber and the right atrium is just bigger than that. So if you look at it like on a clock, at the first position we have the left ventricle and it is the largest. And we come down to the next position, we have the left atrium, it's the next largest, then the right atrium, and then back to the right ventricle. So going around the clock, we have big, smaller, smaller, smallest to the right ventricle. In this image, we see that the right atrium is bigger than the left atrium, therefore this is an abnormal heart. The right ventricle is actually bigger than the left atrium. That's another indication that this patient has a dilated right side of their heart. Both right ventricle and the right atrium is enlarged. By using this Gestalt method of comparing chambers one to another, we can get an indication of abnormalities. For example, the right ventricle should not be as big as the left ventricle. If the ratio between the two is one to one, or the right ventricle is as big as the left ventricle, you know that there's elevated pulmonary pressures. So how do we measure it? Well, we use M-mode. In this case, we have a peristernal long axis, and we've placed our M-mode cursor through the aortic valve, and we can see number one is the aortic valve, and we can measure the aortic root. We can see that number two goes through the left atrium, so we can measure the left atrial size. As we move down, similar to how we were measuring the ejection fraction a few moments ago, we can measure the ventricular cavity the left ventricular cavity, we can measure the septal wall and we can measure the posterior wall. Now, when you look in a textbook, you see that there are several categories of shock. Septic shock, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemic shock, obstructive, which is really tamponade, and obstructive, which it can be PE. And if you look, it will give you an indication of cardiac function. So in septic shock, you generally have a hyperdynamic ventricle, and the IVC is generally small because the fluid has been distributed to out to the peripheral tissue, so there's a low central venous pressure. In cardiogenic shock, you have a hypodynamic LV, therefore the pressure backs up in the IVC, creating an elevated central venous pressure or a dilated IVC. In hypovolemic shock, such as bleeding, then you have a hyperdynamic LV that's trying to maintain blood pressure, though there's very little filling of blood in the heart. As a consequence, the central venous pressure is low or the IVC is small. In obstructive shock that's caused by cardiac tamponade, there's a pericardial effusion as we talked about before, diastolic collapse of the RV, 
and because the blood can't fill the right ventricle, there's a dilated IVC as the central venous pressure is high. An obstructive shock caused by a PE, there's a dilated right ventricle and a right atria. And the IVC is also dilated because blood can't get through the lungs. A better way to think of this, though, is to start with the IVC. So, if you look at the IVC itself, these possible causes of shock are easily differentiated into low CVP shock and high CVP shock. So if you look at the IVC and it's small and it's collapsed, you know the central venous pressure is low. If you integrate the other things you know about the patient, such as they've had a history of vomiting or diarrhea, then you know the probable cause is dehydration. If the IVC is small and the central venous pressure is low and they've just been in a trauma and they're bleeding, then you know that the potential cause of their shock is hemorrhage. If it's small and low and you have a history of fever and you look at the heart and it's hyperdynamic, more than likely they have septic shock. If it's dilated, we have a different set of differential causes. So combining with our other clinical findings, such as uremia, and they have a pericardial effusion, we think that they have tamponade. It's dilated, so the central venous pressure is high, and they have chest pain. It's a hypodynamic LV. That's cardiogenic shock. It's dilated. Their central venous pressure is high. They have acute shortness of breath, massive PE, particularly when you look at the right and left ventricle, and they are the same size, or the right ventricle is larger than the left ventricle. And you look at the IVC and it's dilated, so the central venous pressure is high. They have a history of end-stage renal disease. They miss dialysis. That would be volume overload. So let's go back to cases. So we look at the heart here. This is a subcostal view of the heart. We look at the IVC. It's dilated. It's not collapsing. Therefore, the central venous pressure is high. The patient's hypotensive and they're complaining of chest pain. So let's look at the left ventricle. We look at the left ventricle and the EF is poor. Therefore, if we put all this together, we have a dilated IVC with little collapse. That means the central venous pressure is high. The heart is tachycardic, but the squeeze is poor. So if this patient was hypotensive, what would we guess the cause of their shock would be? Cardiogenic shock. Similar patient. This patient is hypotensive, they have chest pain, but they also have fever. Let's look at their IVC. It's very difficult to see their IVC. It's slit-like. It's completely collapsed. Let's look at the left ventricle. The heart's beating fast. It's beating hard. And if you look, most of the black space is disappearing with each beat, so the EF is high. So let's put this together. We have the IVC is collapsed. It's slit-like. That means that the central venous pressure is very low. Heart is tachycardic, and the LV function is very good, or hyperdynamic, ejecting most of the blood that is coming into it. Therefore, if we put this together with our history of chest pain, shortness of breath, and fever, we suspect that they have septic shock. Here's a different patient. Hypotensive, chest pain, syncope, shortness of breath. We see that their blood pressure is 79 over 53, the heart rate's 124, and they're tachypnic. This is a subcostal view of the heart. As we come through the subcostal view, we see a dilated right atrium, a dilated right ventricle. And if we look at the IVC, it's also very dilated. If we look at the right ventricle versus the left ventricle, or the right atrium versus the left atrium, we can see that the right side of the heart is bigger than the left side of the heart. In an acute situation, if we put this all together, we can see that the IVC is dilated, so the central venous pressure is high, the heart's tachycardic, the LV function is hyperdynamic, ejecting most of the blood that is being given to it, and if we look at the two chamber sizes that we have here, the right ventricle is much enlarged over the left ventricle. The right atria is very enlarged, and the left atria can't even be seen. In this case, we know that there's acute pulmonary hypertension. So the cause of this patient that is in shock would be obstructive shock or pulmonary embolism. Here's another patient. Hypotensive, chest pain, trauma. We can see that there is a pericardial effusion. IVC would be expected to be dilated in pericardial tamponade. So if this patient is hypotensive and has a pericardial effusion and the IVC is dilated, we would know it's tamponade. So let's check. We look, 
here's the IVC, it is dilated, it is not collapsing. So we know the central venous pressure is high. We add that to what we knew before that the patient is tachycardic and has a pericardial effusion and the LV function is hyperdynamic. Therefore, this is obstructive shock and due to tamponade. So in conclusion, bedside cardiac ultrasound can have a dramatic effect on clinical practice. I just gave you an overview of how to integrate this in clinical practice. As you begin doing ultrasound, you will find new and better ways to integrate this into your practice. A knowledge of normal anatomy and the limitations of ultrasound is key, as well as figuring out the whole issue of clinical integration. Mm-hmm.